I invite you please to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Galatians. I think on every third chair there's a rack underneath and there are some Bibles there if you need one, but I trust you brought your own with you this morning. We're in the book of Galatians this morning, Paul's letter to the Galatians, probably the first letter that the Apostle Paul wrote as an apostle. And because we have been out of Galatians for about three weeks now, just to review a little bit. First of all, uh, this letter was written because there was a problem in the region of Galatia. A problem in Galatia. In short, what had happened was that the, a group of false teachers had come into the church after Paul had left, into many of the churches in the Galatian region. And they were, what they were saying to the believers in the churches was that Paul isn't really an apostle. So they discredited his apostleship. Secondly, they said that, that Paul had not given to them the true gospel, that what he had preached to them, taught them for whatever time he was with them, uh, was, was lacking in some way. And what they were saying was what Paul forgot to tell you or he purposefully didn't tell, tell you, is that in order for you Gentiles to become true Christians, you have to become Jewish first. You have to adopt Jewish customs. You have to ado- adopt Jewish culture. And of course, what that meant was you have to be circumcised. Their slogan was Acts chapter 15, verse 1, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So in essence, what they were doing was exactly what they were accusing Paul of doing. They were saying that, 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 that Paul had taken stuff out of the gospel, circumcision, but they were adding circumcision to the gospel. They were saying Paul hasn't given you the whole, the whole bag. They were saying, here's what was missing in the bag. And so they invalidated the gospel that Paul preached. So in essence, what they were saying was that Paul, who claims to be an apostle, he contradicts what the other apostles teach. And if you take guys like Peter and John, the, you know, the, the two top apostles, and, and James, who's the Lord's brother, and, and he just happens to be the leader of the church in Jerusalem, which is the most important church. If you take what they say, they agree with us, and they do not agree with the apostle Paul. So Paul wrote this letter to address this, this issue. Secondly, what we have here in this passage is a meeting in Jerusalem. So there was the problem in Galatia, but now we have this meeting in Jerusalem. A meeting takes place, a very, very important historic meeting. If you've been a Christian for any period of time, you know that that church life involves meetings, right? There's meetings for this and meetings for that. I mean, here we are meeting together today to worship. And there are some meetings that go on in the life of the church that you as the average member or attender of a church might wish you could be a part of. For example, the elders meet once a month. Or our ministry team meets every Tuesday morning and and we're in closed session, we're in closed doors. No one can get into those meetings. And you might say, well, I wish I was a fly on the wall in one of the elders' meetings of the church. I can remember back in 1977 when I went to the Billy Graham School of Evangelism in Toronto. Dr. Billy Graham was preaching in Toronto at that time, a big evangelistic mission. And um, the Billy Graham School of Evangelism was held at Yorkminster Park Baptist Church. And I went as an intern of the church I was at with another fellow who was an intern in the church. And we, we sat there and heard the greatest teachers teach about evangelism and challenge us to share our faith. And at one point in the meetings... Cliff Barrows got up, who was the song leader. He's now with the Lord, Billy Graham's song leader. And he said, I'm calling you all to prayer now. We're going to stop our teaching session. We're going to go to prayer because Dr. Graham is now in Ottawa for the day, and he is in the prime minister's office in Mr. Trudeau, not Justin Trudeau's office, Pierre Trudeau's office. And he's having a meeting with Mr. Trudeau, and we're going to pray. And I remember praying for Pierre Trudeau. And I remember thinking to myself, man, would I love to be a fly on the wall in that meeting in the prime minister's office in Ottawa. What did Billy Graham say to him? Only eternity will tell. Well, here it was a closed-door meeting. It was small. 
It might seem a little distant to us. As we read the passage, you'll say, well, how in, how in the world does this, this meeting in Jerusalem relate to me? But before we read the passage, I want to assure you that in this meeting, the stakes were very high. If there was an important meeting, this was it. This was a watershed moment in the history of the Christian church. Christianity was influenced till today because of this meeting that happened in Jerusalem. Galatians chapter 2, verse 1. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem. This time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed or reputed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because, because some false believers or false brothers had, had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. As for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognized that I, Paul, had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, that is, to the Gentiles, just as Peter had been given, had been to the circumcised, to the Jews. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, that is Peter, and John, those esteemed, reputed to be pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do all along. I want you to notice the attendees of this meeting, who was actually there. First of all, there was Paul. He writes the letter, he tells the story. Paul was there. Now, Paul is a significant person in this letter, in this meeting, because Paul, as we know, is the great apostle to the Gentiles. He underscores that in the reading. You pick that up immediately. But you remember in Acts chapter 9 when he was knocked off of his horse on his way to the city of Damascus? To go there as Saul of Tarsus to persecute the church? What did the Lord say to him? I mean, God got a hold of him right at that moment in time. Jesus came into his life in power. And what Jesus said to him was that you're going to suffer many things and you will bear my name to the Gentile peoples. And he reiterates that in Acts chapter 26 when he's standing before King Agrippa. He reminds Agrippa of this truth that Paul was called to take the gospel to the Gentile people. Now remember that, that this was something new because the Jews had it in their minds that, that when, when, they, when they came to Christ that the Messiah is ours, Jesus is ours, he belongs to us exclusively. Paul is the apostle, not to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. The second individuals that we read of here are Paul's companions. He took two of them with him. The first one he mentions in verse 2, or in verse 1, is Barnabas. Now, Bar Barnabas was a, was, a, was a wonderful man. His name means the son of encouragement. And whenever you read about him in God's word, and you'll, you'll find him all throughout the book of Acts, whenever you read about him, he's always doing encouraging things. He encouraged others. In Acts chapter 5, we read that he was very generous in his, in his, in his giving, and he, he came and he had sold some of his land, and he laid all the money that he had received from the sale of the land at the apostles' feet. He was a good steward of the resources that God had given to him. Then in Acts chapter 9, after Paul has been converted, Paul comes to Jerusalem for the first time. This was 14 years before this was written. And, of course, everyone knows who he is. Like, this is Saul of Tarsus. This is the guy who was persecuting the church. We can't let him into the church. And Barnabas comes alongside Saul and encourages him. 
And he brings Saul to the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. He brings him to the apostles. And he says, look, this guy has really become a believer. And so through Barnabas then, Saul of Tarsus was accepted as a brother into the church. And then in Acts chapter 11, we read that Barnabas went all the way up to Tarsus where where Paul was now living, and he got him and he brought him down to the city of Antioch because Barnabas was carrying on a great mission there. And Barn- or, or Paul became the partner of Barnabas in the preaching of the gospel and establishing the church in Antioch. And then both he and Barnabas went out on their first missionary journey. And if you follow the story through in Acts, Acts chapter 13 and 14, you will see that Barnabas was the leader in that relationship up to a certain point. And then Barnabas said, Paul, you've, you've got the gifts. I've trained you. And he handed the leadership over to Paul. And he became, he became that great, great missionary who we know of as the Apostle Paul. The next companion that Paul brought with him was Titus. He's mentioned also in verse 1. I took Titus along also. And you might say, well, so what? Titus was there. Well, the significance of Titus being there is found in verse 3. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. Titus was not a Jew. He was a Greek. Barnabas, then, was the one who persuaded Paul to join him in great mission to the Gentiles, but Titus was the product of Paul's mission to the Gentiles. And there's a letter in the Bible that is given to Titus, written to to him. And in Titus 1, verse 4, Paul refers to Titus as his son in the faith. So, So Titus had come to Christ through the preaching of Paul. And he assisted Paul later in his ministry in some of the problems that Paul had to to work through in the various churches that he established. In essence, bringing Titus to the meeting was Exhibit A. Let me present Titus to you. He's a Gentile. He's a Greek. He has never been circumcised. He has never adopted Jewish customs. But he's a true, bona fide believer in Jesus who has been touched by Jesus' grace. The test case. Now, the third group of individuals who are in this meeting were the Jerusalem church leaders. And in verse 9, Paul refers to them as pillars. They were pillars in the church. These were men of great esteem, greatly honored. They occupied an important leadership position in the church. Now, he mentions them, of course, in verse 9. And I'm going to mention them now, not in the order in which they're mentioned here in in verse 9. I'm going to say James for last. We'll start with Cephas, who is also called Peter. We know that Peter was the most prominent of all the apostles of the Lord Jesus. If you read through Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you discover that every time the apostles are in some kind of a conversation with Jesus, it's usually Peter who's at the start of the the conversation. And every time the apostles are listed by the gospel writers, Peter is always up at the top. He was the leader of this band of apostles, most of them fishermen. That's what Peter was. So he was the leader among the apostles, and it was to Peter that Jesus said, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus gave the keys to Peter as the leader of the apostolic band, meaning it was Peter who first took the gospel to the Jews, and when he preached the gospel to the Jews in Acts chapter 2, what in essence was Peter doing? He was taking the keys that Jesus gave him. And through preaching the gospel, Peter opened the door of faith to all the Jews. They could come to Christ. They could come to their Messiah. If they would believe in the Messiah, only through faith in the Messiah would they be saved. And then in Acts chapter 10, Peter takes the keys again, and he opens the door of faith, this time to the Gentiles. And a man by the name of Cornelius, a Roman, and all of his household come to faith in Jesus Christ because Peter used the key of the kingdom, which is the preaching of the gospel, to bring the Gentiles, the first group of Gentiles, into the Christian church. So Peter is a pretty important person in this story. We also read in verse 9 that John was there. This is the Apostle John. And whenever the Apostle John is referred to in the book of Acts, it's usually with Peter. Peter and John, Peter and John, Peter and John. 
John was a great leader, but Peter seemed to be the number one guy. But John, of course, is the beloved apostle. He's the one who laid his head on Jesus' breast when they were at the table. He was the one who referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. John is the great gospel writer, the gospel of John. And it was the apostle John who gave us the most famous verse in all of God's word. You know the verse, John 3.16, which is, let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That was the verse that John wrote. And John also wrote for us the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation ends with this incredible vision of all of the nations, not just the Jews, but all of the nations standing before the throne of God and the throne of the Lamb. And then we have James. Now, James probably needs a little bit more information for us. James here... um, was not the Apostle James. Rather, this was James, the brother of Jesus. Both Matthew and Mark record for us that Mary and Joseph, after Jesus was born, that they had other kids, and James was probably the oldest brother. In John chapter 7, we read that Jesus' brothers did not initially believe in him. But there in the story at the beginning of the church in Acts chapter 1, there are the brothers of Jesus with Mary and the apostles praying in the city of Jerusalem. I think the turning point was in Acts chapter 15, or 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7, where it says that the Lord then appeared to James after his resurrection. And so James wrote the book of James, and he became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. These were the men who were the pillars of the church. But there were also some other individuals who actually snuck their way into the meeting, and Paul refers to them in verse 4 as false believers or false brothers. He says here, they infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus. I like how J.B. Phillips puts it in his paraphrase of that verse. He says, they wormed their way into the meeting. They wormed their way into the meeting. Paul considered them nothing more than spies. They weren't true followers of the Lord. Those are the people who attended the meeting. Now, the reason for the meeting... There are three reasons why this meeting happened. First of all, I want you to notice that that Paul was actually summoned by God to this meeting. He says in verse 1 that he went up to Jerusalem. In verse 2, he says, I went in response to a revelation. Paul's saying it was God who told me to go to, to Jerusalem. Notice, Paul is saying, I was not summoned by the apostles to be in this meeting. It wasn't like the apostles were saying, we don't know what this guy Paul is teaching. We think he's teaching something wrong. We need to bring him here to Jerusalem to set him straight. Paul says, no, that's not what happened at all. God told me to go, is what he says. Paul was summoned by God to the meeting. Number two, that, that, that tells you that this meeting is important to God. Number, number two, Paul set before the apostles and James, the leaders of the church, the pillars, he set before them the gospel message that he preached. Verse 2, I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. Why? Well, I wanted to be sure I was not running or had not been running my race in vain. Maybe I've got it wrong. I need to put it before them. They'll confirm with what I'm, as to what I'm saying is true. And so he had been preaching the gospel for 14 years. I don't think Paul had any doubts or misgivings about what he was preaching, but he wanted to overthrow the influence of these false teachers, so he set before the apostles, this is the gospel I preach. And frankly, if you want to know what he preached, it's summarized in verse 15 and 16 of this passage. Know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too, Jews, have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But he didn't just set before the apostles his message. He set before the apostles his Gentile convert, Titus. Here's Titus. I want to introduce you to him. That was a pretty gutsy move on Paul's part. Because the issue is, Greeks who've never been circumcised, who have not become culturally Jewish, they can't be totally saved, and they can't be accepted into the church. 
They have to be circumcised. Paul just brings them right into the meeting. I want you to meet this guy. He's never been circumcised. Pretty gutsy move. A very provocative move. How would they react? Would they reject Paul's message? Would they not receive Titus as a brother in the Lord? Now, behind all of this, there was something at stake, something very, very important. So we come now to the issues at stake. There were essentially two things, but they're so closely related to each other. The first thing was, what was at stake was the truth of the gospel. And the second thing was true church unity. And you'll see how these two relate to each other. The truth of the gospel. Verse 5, we did not give in to them. That is, I didn't give in to these false brothers and what these false brothers were saying, that Titus has to be circumcised. I didn't give in to them for a moment. Why? So that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. So what is the truth of the gospel then? What, what's, what's Paul driving at? Well, he tells us what the gospel is in verses 15 and 16, but, but let me put it in a different way. The truth of the gospel is this, that Jew and Gentile are accepted by God on the same terms. And those terms are faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. Only through faith in Christ are we accepted by God. Therefore, if the Gentiles have been accepted by God through their faith in Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, then they must be accepted by the church without any discrimination at all. To put it in another way, any friend of Jesus is a friend of mine. That's, what, in essence, what Paul was saying. So Paul saw the issue clearly here. This wasn't an issue just about circumcision. This isn't, wasn't an issue just about, about Jewish customs. This was an issue between freedom and bondage. The Christian, the one who believes in Jesus, has been set free from the law of Moses in the sense that our acceptance depends not on our keeping the law. Our acceptance by God depends on our faith in Jesus Christ. We are saved solely by faith in Jesus. If we interject the works of the law into a system of salvation, then all we are doing is going back into bondage again. We are putting upon ourselves a yoke which none of us can bear. And so Titus is the test case. He's uncircumcised, but he really believes in Jesus. So he's been accepted by God. And Paul says, faith alone in Jesus Christ alone is enough. It's all that's needed. Nothing else is necessary. And so he stood firm. He was determined to establish the truth of the gospel and to maintain it. But this affects true church unity. So on the one side, you have Paul, and he's saying, the gospel is this, faith in Jesus Christ alone is all that is necessary for everyone, regardless of where they're from, regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of what culture they come from. On the other side are these spies, these false brothers who say, no, 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 no. We want the Gentiles to believe in Jesus. We want everyone to believe in Jesus. But they have to add the works of the law to their faith. They have to be circumcised. They have to become good Jews before we will receive them into the fellowship of the church. So this was what the issue was. If the apostles would side with these false believers... If they would tolerate them and tolerate their te teaching, there would be an incredible church split. And neither side, Gentile nor Jew, would ever accept each other again. So the apostles, perhaps they hadn't thought through the implications of this Jewishness that, that was being injected into the gospel. It might have been very easy for them to think, being Jews themselves and living in Jerusalem, sort of the, 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 the hotbed of Jewish life, living there in that culture, immersed in that, they might have thought, well, 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 of course, Gentiles should become good Jews as well. 
But Paul saw the issue clearly, and he realized that if we allow this teaching into the church, it will destroy the church. It will, it, it, it will annihilate the truth of the gospel. Stakes couldn't have been higher. The gospel was at stake. The unity of the church was at stake. So what was the outcome of the meeting? For the outcome of the meeting, there were three things that basically happened. First of all, verse 3 tells us that Titum, Titus was not compelled to be circumcised. Do you see that? James and Peter and, and John, they didn't say, what? You're not circumcised? You don't have to be circumcised. We accept you as a brother. They welcome this Gentile into their fellowship. There was no demand from the apostles that, that Titus had to engage in law-keeping and adopt Jewish customs. We, they had fellowship with Titus. They accepted him as a brother. Secondly, Paul's gospel was not contradicted or changed in any way. Look at, look at verse, verse uh, 6. The last line of verse 6. They added nothing to my message. They didn't edit Paul's gospel. They didn't supplement it with some other truths. They didn't modify it in any way. They didn't rework it and remassage it in any way. They, they said, your gospel, what you're preaching about Jesus and about faith alone in Jesus, it's not defective at all. It's exactly what we preach. They didn't say to Paul, well, you know, your, your, your gospel is okay as far as it goes, but it only goes 95%. There's another 5% that needs to be added. There is nothing like that at all. They added nothing to my message, which means they agreed with Paul that it is faith alone in Jesus Christ that saves us. Now, the implications of this are, are, are myriad. They're so fundamental to the Christian life. Let me just kind of go on a little excursus here for a moment. As you read the Old Testament, you, you read about all of these regulations, the, the ceremonies that the Jewish people had to do under the law of Moses. And these ceremonies all related to becoming clean in God's sight. So there would be things they would do. They would wash themselves before worship. They had to wash their hands, had to wash their feet. They had to be circumcised or they couldn't come into the presence of God. That was all a part of the ritual, the ceremonial law. Now we read those things and we wonder, well, well, well Okay, it's in the Bible, so it's got to be important. And, and, and this, what we need to understand is that all of these things that were there, those ceremonies, they were designed by God before Jesus came into the world because God had a purpose in those ceremonies. And the ceremonies were to show the Jews that it was impossible to make themselves acceptable to God and clean before God. Impossible. Impossible. We can't save ourselves. We can't make ourselves clean. We can't make ourselves acceptable to God. So God, God gave them this whole system put in place to show them that in order that they would call out to God for grace and mercy. But the false teachers were saying the opposite. Well, all those things are there in the Old Testament because they still need to be observed to this very day. That's what they were saying. But Paul pointed out in his writings, and Jesus himself said it, that, that all of these ceremonial laws, they pointed to Jesus. Jesus said it this way. He says, I have not come to abolish the law of the prophets. I'm not going to do away with it. He said, rather, I have come to fulfill the law and the prophets. So all of those laws, all of those ceremonies were actually fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It is faith alone that makes us acceptable to God. It is faith alone in Jesus Christ that makes us clean. And because the apostles accepted the message of Paul in toto, they accepted Titus just as he was as a brother in the Lord. The third thing that happened the third outcome of the meeting was that Paul and Barnabas were accepted as partners with the apostles, and they were entrusted with the same, the same gospel. Look at verse 9. James, Peter, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas, notice this, the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. What's Paul saying? He's saying they stuck out their hands, and they, we, sh we shook on it. Now, there's a lot in that. This isn't just a, a gesture. 
that, uh, that we think you're a nice guy. This was agreement. This was unity. The only difference that Paul said existed between them was what he talks about in verse 7, where they said, Paul, you take the gospel to the Gentiles, and Peter will take the gospel to the Jews. They accepted Paul and Barnabas as equal partners in the work of the gospel. Now, how does all this relate to us today? Interesting story, John. Wow, you've given, a nice, given us a nice analysis of a meeting that happened 2,000 years ago. But how does it relate to us today? Let me give you six takeaways take, take, take for today. Six things. Number one, there is only one gospel. And that gospel is unchanging. And that gospel must be preserved by us. That's what Paul does all through chapter 1. He's doing it here in chapter 2. Listen, the apostles of Jesus did not contradict each other. They spoke to different people. They spoke with different emphasis. And they, of course, had their unique, different personalities. But everything they said was in concert with each other. There is one gospel. But here's what we need to understand. Just as the gospel, the simplicity of the gospel message was being attacked here, Let's add circumcision to it. So the gospel is being attacked today. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is always under attack. Always. In Philippians, Paul makes reference to those who are the enemies of the cross. In other words, they're saying that the cross isn't necessary. The cross is absolutely necessary. What Jesus did on the cross is absolutely necessary because Jesus fulfilled the law on the cross when he died for our sins. He fulfilled the law in his perfect life and he fulfilled the law in his death. All of the punishments of the law were fulfilled in Jesus. So the cross is absolutely essential. So to add anything to the cross, to distort the cross, or to take the cross away is to abandon the gospel. And Paul says here in verse 5 that the truth of the gospel must be preserved. Number two. Actually, number two and three are closely related to each other. It is that the gospel leads to freedom. Let's put both two and three up on the screen. The gospel leads to freedom. And by freedom, we're talking about two different things here. I'm indebted to Tim Keller on these two points. Powerful points. First of all, the gospel leads to cultural freedom. What do I mean by that? Well, well verse 4, Paul talks about these false brothers com- coming into spy on the freedom that they have in Christ Jesus. Remember this. Any system of religion which says something like this, you have to earn your salvation. You gotta do stuff to be saved. Any system of salvation like that will lead you into bondage. It leads you into bondage. So how does the gospel give us freedom? Two ways. First of all, the gospel gives us cultural freedom. Any kind of moralistic religion that presses you to adopt very specific rules, especially rules that pertain to externals, not to internals, but externals. Any moralistic religion that presses you to adopt very specific rules, regulations for your dress or your daily behavior in this world, brings you into bondage. And why do I say that? Because if salvation depends upon obeying rules and regulations, then, of course, we're going to want those regulations to be very specific, doable, and clear. The last thing you want is a rule like, love your neighbor as yourself. Why? Well, that's just way too demanding. That's way too to high. high. So we want to make it easy. What you really want is don't do certain things. Don't go to movies. Don't listen to secular music. And by the way, you shouldn't listen to country music. <laughs> don't drink alcohol. Don't eat certain kinds of food. Don't dance and don't chew and don't go with girls that do. But you know what rules like this do? They get you into the area of daily cultural life. Now, if these false teachers had had their way, you know what would have happened? Greeks, Africans, Arabs, 
could not become Christians unless they became culturally Jewish first. And you know what the end result would have been there? All that would do is promote intolerance and prejudice in the church. And that's what those man-made rules do when you impose them on people. You just bring intolerance and prejudice into the church and you destroy the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. The gospel leads to cultural freedom. Secondly, or thirdly, the gospel leads to emotional freedom. Emotional freedom. Now what do we mean by this? If you believe that your relationship with God is based on you keeping up all the time your good moral behavior, then you are on an endless treadmill. And you will be filled with guilt and insecurity. Guilt because you can never live up to all the law. And insecurity because if you can't live up to all the law, then you, you're not secure. You don't, you don't think God accepts you. It's important that we understand this, that the Bible, the Bible does not free us from the imperatives of God's moral law, the Ten Commandments. We're not supposed to lie. We're not supposed to steal. We're not supposed to, to take someone else's wife. The Ten Commandments are very, very clear. But, but, though we are not free from the moral law as a way in which we should live, we are free from the moral law as a system of salvation. I have to obey the law in order to be saved. We as Christians obey the law not in fear and insecurity of trying to earn our salvation, but we want to obey the law in freedom and security because we have already been saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. So our motive in obeying the law is a grace-gratitude motive. The gospel leads to emotional freedom. Number four, the apostles' unity is our unity. I want to underscore that. What the apostles had right here, what they were cherishing and developing and maintaining, that's what we have. It's a precious gift from the apostles. Peter, Peter didn't say to Paul, okay, you know, Paul, I've heard a few things about you in the past. Not sure if you're a nice guy. I've just discovered today that you are a nice guy. Let's have fellowship with each other. That's not what happened here. The apostles didn't have unity because they were all Jews. The apostles didn't experience unity among themselves because they were all from the same particular ethnic group. They didn't have unity because they all looked alike or they all had the same kind of employment before they met Jesus. The apostles didn't have unity because they were all circumcised Jews. They didn't have unity because we all eat kosher food. And we all wear the same clothes. And we all have the same customs. No. The apostles had unity because they believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has justified us. And anyone who Jesus justifies is our brother and sister. Amen? Any friend of Jesus is a friend of mine. And so we accept anyone and we accept everyone who is in Christ, regardless of their social status, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of their race. Jesus has eliminated all, th all those things and we are one in him. Number five, there are limits to gospel unity. There are limits. This whole matter, this meeting in Jerusalem, arose because of these false brothers who had infiltrated the meeting. Now, it's very clear in this passage, Paul was not willing to share church life with those who believed a different gospel. Period. Sorry, sounds pretty exclusive, but them's the facts. He was not willing to share church uni unity with those who believed a different gospel. The gospel is the basis of our unity. Paul, or Peter, James, and John gave to Paul the right hand of fellowship. Now when they did, when they said to Barnabas and Paul, you're with us, you're partners with us, 
That right hand of fellowship signified friendship, cooperation, communion, approval, acceptance, unity. This was more than just a polite, con a polite courtesy. Conversely, when they took the hands of Barnabas and Paul and shook those hands, they were also excluding those other brothers. Do you, do you follow what I'm saying? They were saying, we agree with you. We're in partnership with you. You guys, we don't believe you. We don't believe what you're saying. What you're teaching is wrong. It isolated and it discredited the false brothers. By including Paul and Barnabas and Titus, they were excluding the false brothers. We must not, hear me on this, we must not maintain our unity as a church at the expense of the gospel. Tim Keller writes, and I, I want to quote him here, freedom and community are two great yearnings of the human heart. Isn't that true? That's really an insightful comment. Freedom and community are the two great yearnings of the human heart. We want to be free and we want to belong. He says, neither one of these longings is satisfied by any worldview or any religion which is based on earn your salvation tenets. These will divide people on cultural lines and enslave them emotionally. It is in Christ Jesus that we can enjoy a unity which pays no attention to countries, borders, or cultural boundaries. It was this unity and this freedom which Paul's gospel offered, and it was in defense of these that God prompted him to go to Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. Division and slavery were things Paul would not give in to, and neither should we. And finally, number six. We need to see grace, not differences. I think seeing grace is the decisive thing that happens here in the first 10 verses of Galatians chapter 2. The leaders of the church in Jerusalem, Titus walks in the room, Paul comes in the room, Paul sets out the gospel for this is what I preach. Here's Titus, exhibit A. <laughs> what did the apostles see when that happened? They saw grace. That's what they saw. They saw grace from beginning. They looked at Paul. Do you know what they could have said to Paul? Paul, ever since you became an apostle, do you know what kind of changes have been happening in the church? Do you know all the different things that are going on in the church now because you've become an apostle? Everything's changing and we don't like it. That's not what they said. That is not what happened. Instead, they looked at Paul, and what did they see? They saw the grace of God. Verse 9, they recognized the grace given to me. They said, Paul, because of you, the church is changing. Because of you, the gospel is advancing. Gentiles are getting saved. Hallelujah. That's what they said. They saw grace. They saw that the church was becoming, in their day, exactly what God intended it to be when he gave the promise to Abraham that through Abraham's seed, all nations would be blessed. That the church would become an international family of God. When they looked at Titus, do you know what they could have said? You're a Greek. You're not circumcised. We can't have fellowship with you. Become like us first. And then you can be our brother. That's not what happened. Instead, they saw Titus and they said, we welcome you, brother. And we love you with all of our heart. And we accept you as just as Jesus has accepted you. And our hearts are thrilled that God has added you, a Gentile, to his church. Brothers and sisters in Jesus, this is a gospel culture. And that is the culture that should characterize us as a people. What are you seeing? Grace or differences? Any friend of Jesus is a friend of mine. Let's stand. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, our Father in heaven, we ask.
that with the help of the Holy Spirit, with the help of your Spirit, you will drive these truths deep into our hearts that we might become a fellowship of believers that truly bring glory to you in all that we do, in all that we say, and in all that we think, for Jesus' sake. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.